I am a journals publisher. Please don't throw the rotten fruit until afterwards, if that's okay. Um, so yeah, so um, obviously I'm here today to talk about open research, accessibility, transparency, and impact. And you know, something, some of it, what well, I'm gonna talk about, we've already touched upon. Some is coming, um, so that's fine. Um, I did think, and I'm just gonna ask quickly, look at the um, organizers. Um, I'll go through my talk as I was planning, but then would it be okay if at the end I kind of addressed some of the things that have already popped up? Uh, okay. Yeah, if you have to, that's okay. okay then. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to start with um, a quick thing about you know open research, um, and I've got this, and I actually have um, a version of this that people can take home with them. I've got a, I've got it on a postcard because I just wanted to make sure we quickly have a have a very quick overview of open research. Um, open research, sometimes called open science, um, is the kind of is the term used for all the different kind of open things within. Um, within scholarship. Uh, open access is obviously the most well known, that's the thing that most people are talking about, but we're talking about open data, collaboration, um, recognition and practices. And I am going to do a bit of a more detailed one uh, explanation in a minute, but I thought that actually I just wanted to start with this just so we're all clear on how I'm thinking about it. So yeah, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start by talking about open access because that is that is the big thing for the last 12 months. There's been no escaping it. So I just want to put that in context. Then I want to talk a bit more about open research in general and what we might be seeing coming next, what's coming beyond open access. And then I'm going to think about specifically about archaeological communication and the impact this might have on that. So I'm, I am going to start with the definition of open access um, because in talking to editors, there are, I've got editors that have been on my journal for 40 years. I've got editors that have been on for four months. Um, the knowledge of what actually open access is, is hugely variable. So I just wanted to check. And I've taken this from the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which is a bit old now, but I think sums it up nicely. And it says, you know, by open access, this is literature, which we mean it's freely available on the public internet permitting any users to read, download, copy, distribute, print, search, link to the full text of these items, crawl them for indexing, pass them on as data or software, and use them for any lawful purpose without financial, legal, or technical barriers other than those inseparable from gaining access to the internet itself. So it's three elements here. One, open access is a digital only thing. Print does not come into it. Two, it's free. Yeah. Three, it can be reused in any way. Now there are a few different um, licenses which mean you, go, you can't use it for commercial, you can't manipulate it. In general that is the key thing. Although copyright stays with the author, in practice anyone can reuse your work. So right now everyone in this room could go to Wiley's website, you could download every open access article Wiley has ever published and you could put it on your own website so long as you say where you got it from. Okay? I just want to make absolutely clear from a because from a like a publisher a more publisher perspective all open access articles are free but not all free articles are open access okay I've also got a little bit of a thing about you know the gold and green we've already spoken about that so I probably won't go into it in more detail but um, green is the um, basically when you, it's um, embargoed for a period of time and then it's you can do what you want with it afterwards six months to two years it depends on the subject and of course gold is when you pay um, up front and it goes free immediately again with what I've just said there's also a whole bunch of others like bronze platinum diamond but I'm not going to go into those those are much there's a lot more to talk about and um, again you've already seen this there's are more licenses but this is just a quick at a glance you know the main ones um, the CCBY is the most common um, and then you've got kind of the non-commercial obviously that's quite obvious um, and uh, non-distribution so those are kind of the main the main things I did think it would be also be quite useful to do this kind of overview like how have we got to the place we are now so the conversation around open access I mean it started in the 90s open research and open science has been going on for a long time but it really kicked off in the year 2000 obviously the internet was starting to become a thing then, that's the main thing. Um, and then as you can see, um, you know, the first few years we had things like the Budapest Open Initiative, PLOS One came out, you know, that was a big thing. It was really um, in the kind of the beginning of this decade that it really started to take pace, you know. Publishers started to have green and gold. Uh, the Finch Report in the UK uh, recommended gold open access for um, 
for uh, UK research. Um, obviously, though, it's really been in the last couple of years that it's really taken on. Um, the big thing, of course, was Germany. So Deal, the German Library Consortia, um, they obviously had a conversation with Elsevier. This is all in um, international newspapers. You can go and look at this up at this yourself. Uh, they said we want a read and publish agreement. That's when um, they pay. So they pay a fee, um, and all the articles from that point onwards are made open access. And then the fee also covers, you know, the articles that from the past that are not open access. So they have that kind of. That's how it works. Elsa Fear said, no, what are you going to do? Cancel your subscription? And Deal said, yes. <coughs> so Deal cancelled their subscription. So um, if you were a scholar in Germany, you did not have access to Elsevier content from the point when that agreement ended and they started it again. Um, that has happened, and this has not just happened in Germany, this has happened throughout Europe, and most recently the University of California had the same thing. Um, Deal was not the only country who said that we don't want to pay subscriptions anymore. We want to um, reduce this. And this all comes back again, 2017, Horizon 2020, OA 2020, a general feeling that you know we need to lower the amount of money that's in publishing. We need to start moving towards open access and all that kind of thing. So um, a lot of countries are moving towards read and publish agreements. They, so Deal has one now with Wiley and Elsevier. The Netherlands, MIT has one with the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, there's there's a lot of them happening now, and these are these are country level. So it's it's so in the UK it would obviously be JISC, and actually CUP has the, one of these agreements with JISC. They were the first publisher in the UK to do that. Of course, towards the end of 2018, Coalition S came up, um, and that really got everyone's attention. Um, obviously, there has been a lot said about Coalition S, and I'll probably say a little bit more about that. Um, they released their initial ideas of what they wanted open access to be. Loads of people said, wait, no, please, we like open access. But this is going too fast. You're not thinking about other content. You're not thinking about funding. Um, so, so since then, they've revised that slightly. They've revised some of what they want to do. I'm happy to talk about it a bit more if anyone has questions, but I'm aware that we've had a lot of time. Um, and, you know, at the point, we're now at the point where they're getting like another consultation. They originally wanted it to start in open access from January 2020. They've pushed it back to January 2021. Um, the key things from a UK perspective is that the Wellcome Trust and UKRI signed up to Coalition S. But... You know, you know, the UKRI is, you know, going to release its own guidelines around open access imminently. So who knows if they're actually going to go along with what's there or, or not. Um, so we're all kind of waiting on that. And there's a lot of a lot of societies that have done um, some quite good kind of FAQs around Coalition S. The Royal Historical Society has done quite a good one. Um, so I would recommend having a look at that. So basically, that's kind of where we are now in open access. Um, there's pressure coming from lots of different places. So the slides I've got up here, so I've got Horizon 2020, which is kind of the European Commission's push to make all their research open access and to bring down the amount of money. I've got um, a slide here, again, this is a publicly available slide from the Max Planck Institution, which was part of a group, I think, like a, I guess a kind of a think tank, that was coming together saying that we needed to, again, reduce the amount of money in, in publishing, so there was too much. It wasn't fair, we needed to reduce that. So there's that. Plan S, obviously. Um, the movement of these read and publish agreements, which is coming up, which is another kind of pressure, not one on authors, but on publishers. And then I've also got like the um, raw map, so the OA um, research roadmap, <clears throat> because I think then there's just also just general kind of pressure around there. So that's kind of where we are right now. So we're kind of in that transitional phase, really, of what's going to happen. Um, and there have been some really good articles recently um, about, you know, is Coalition S shooting itself in the foot? <laughs> um, what's what's going to happen? Um, but I think the important thing to say is from a European perspective, and even then from a Western European perspective, open access is on the agenda and it's probably not going to go away, no matter, even if Coalition S doesn't happen, it's happening in other ways. There's a pressure coming from multiple areas. 
So I want to move on to open research. So um, again, I've got a, a quote here from the European Commission. Um, it's a broad term covering, you know, the exciting developments um, in how science is becoming more open, accessible, efficient, democratic and transparent. Um, it's really driven by digital tools. So again, it's an online thing and it's about making scientific knowledge more easily accessible. So those are all quite general things. Um, and then I'm going to move on to the, uh, so I already mentioned this. So we've got the open research pillars and there's more information here. Um, so open practices, Zina's already mentioned like open peer review, transparent peer review, um, about making that as easy to see as possible, pre-registered reports, those sorts of things. Open access, obviously, I'm not going to talk about that. Open data, data being in repositories, data being easy to, accept, to get access. Um, open collaboration, obviously, hopefully that's really obvious. And then open recognition and reward, making sure people are being rewarded for what they're doing. I would talk very quickly about data and practices because I think these are the two like most obvious next steps. If we're saying that you can't just think about open access, open data and open practices are the next really obvious one. Open data is really coming to the forefront now. Some journals in the US have made data having op your data freely available mandatory. You cannot publish in those journals if your data is not available. That's it, <coughs> it, done. Um, which may link to what was being said earlier about, you know, the gateways and everything, like what does that mean? Um, a lot of funders are moving towards open data. The Swiss Academy of Humanities and Social Sciences has this week released their own data, open data policy. They want it, that is it, over and done with. Um, and although it's very much the next step, it's getting a lot of mixed responses, particularly from those doing um, qualitative research. There are issues around ethics um, and other things. But the question is, how can we how can we facilitate that, though? If data is becoming the next big thing, how do we facilitate that? And then open practices. And I've said particularly transparent peer review. Peer review is always under pressure. It is always you know, one of the hardest bits of the journal publishing process to have any control over to, to get through. Um, and it's also one of the things where, as has already been uh, highlighted today, it's, it's one of the areas where people feel that you know, that's where the gatekeepers can really be. Um, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, they're worried about the elitism in all subjects within academia and that this is where that is. It's a way to fight that, particularly through transparent peer review. Um, and also about helping to teach the process, helping to teach and train up the next, uh, the next group. And I've had one of my editors tell me that sometimes he finds the reviews almost more interesting than the papers because of the debates it starts. And, you know, how can we then incorporate that? And now I'm going to end by thinking very briefly about um, how this could impact archaeological communication directly. Um, and I think the first thing that I want to say is, on a really simple way, you know, the research system is changing. And if we're going to simplify it, it looks something like this. <laughs> um, you know, because more and more people are having vested interest. You know, it's no longer just the ivory tower type of idea. Um, so this makes it, you know, and so there's a lot of people that have investment in, in research now. But I think moving on from that, we can still think more generally about what's, what it could do, what the impact could be on this subject in particular. Um, so my first, my top first thing was that the, one of the issues, well, the challenges facing archaeology is that it's such a multidisciplinary subject. Very simply, G people doing GIS research are probably going to move at a different pace to people who are perhaps are doing more theoretical or um, archive based research. That is, that is how it is. That's going to make it difficult for there to be a cohesive response to kind of things like open data. But that doesn't mean that you can't try and do it. I do think the idea of coming together, at least in kind of those more general, smaller disciplines, is a really good idea, which has already been mentioned. Um, and also just when you do that, you have more power and more ability to, to influence what's going on. I think one of the plus sides is archaeology in many ways can already be quite a public facing discipline. I mean, the problem with a lot of open access articles in the life and health sciences is very simply, if you don't have a PhD in chemistry, you will not understand that article. It's just, that's just a fact. No matter what we want, might, what we might think, you just, you just won't. Um, but archaeology is a subject that, you know, it's, it's quite tactile. You know, the, 
you know, there are public engagement things already. So that gives it a possibility of, of helping to, to bring those in. Now, we've already had a lovely talk about grey literature, um, but there is possibly an opportunity here for grey literature, you know, particularly if we're thinking about kind of open data. If that's the data behind the articles, then perhaps that's how we're going to bring that in. So it's not an open access article, it's not, still not an article, but it's being brought in in another way. And of course, you know, a lot of people want, if open data is going to become the main thing, then we need to also count citations and track that data. DOIs, ISBNs, whatever, some kind of way to track it is going to be the way to do that. Um, I've put funding question mark because obviously archaeology, like most social science and humanities subjects, funding is, shall we say, <laughs> um, again, that can come back to it being so multidisciplinary. There are some areas, you know, labs, which might be fine, but maybe others won't be. Um, so on the one hand, if you don't have any funding, then you probably don't have to worry quite so much about, oh, is my article, do I have to publish in an open access journal? But then you need funding and then that becomes a, another thing. So that's why I've put funding question mark. This could be something that's really positive. It could not be. But again, if people are coming together and forming core groups, then that could really help. Um, so my final thoughts, really, the point is that kind of open research is about accessibility, it is about transparency, and it is about impact. Those are the kind of the points behind this. Um, and it's really kind of, at the end of the day, it's up to each subject community to decide where they go with that and what they do with that. Um, whatever pressure you put on um, institutions, publishers, that's, that's where it's going to go. Otherwise, they will continue to do what they want. I also put on some resources here. Obviously, I've put the Wiley one because obviously I'm at Wiley. I would highly recommend looking at the Scholarly Kitchen. It is the blog for um, the Scholarly Publishing, um, so like the Scholarly Publishing community. Um, it is very, very informative. Um, they have a whole wide range of people. It's not just from big publishers, it's from societies and everything. And they are great at doing this kind of thing. Uh, again, the OA roadmap, which I think is really just really useful. And I also mentioned the LSE Impact blog. Um, hopefully most of you already know this, but it's the Social Science Impact blog. Again, it's very, very good.